Hey, welcome back. This is it. In today's video, we're going to learn everything about Photoshop selections, layer and vector masks, creating parts with pen tool, and see how they are all interrelated to each other. And in the end, I'm going to show you some cool tricks that you can only do with a pen tool. In the last video, we took a look at Select Subject's amazing new hair selection capabilities. And it also showed that no matter how smart artificial intelligence tools get, it cannot replace the human perception for quality control. When there is lack of clear contrast or color separation, the smart selection tools end up selecting inside the edges of the subject, or in the shadows, or outside in the background areas. Even though we humans can sense the barely visible edge between the subject and the background, artificial intelligence just can't differentiate the edge like our eyes can. And there is no way to tell the smart tool otherwise, because it only follows the algorithm. And sitting around trying to fix these jagged selections, you'll end up spending more time than you intended. So in order to get a well-defined selection, you will have to use a manual method. And the two tools that fit into this category are the polygon lasso tool and of course the pen tool. Let me tell you why I switched to the pen tool. Because like many of you, I avoided the pen tool in the beginning. And I love the polygon lasso tool. It was simple, straightforward, and I could even pull off a smooth curved selection like the pen tool could just by zooming in all the way while making selections. And we can also switch between the lasso tool and the polygon lasso tool in one fluid workflow with one simple shortcut. Just hold down the alt or option when you want to make a freeform selection and you'll have the regular lasso tool. And then when you want to draw the straight lines again, you can release the alt or option and switch back to the polygon lasso. And this alt or option shortcut works irrespective of which lasso tool you pick first. So you can start with the polygon lasso tool or the regular lasso tool. It works the same way. So what made me switch to the pen tool? I was very happy with my lasso tools until I started running into this situation where I selected an entire detail image and halfway through or towards the end something like this would happen where the whole selection got messed up. And you can't undo this because the last recorded step was the start of the new selection or some weird selection shape. So it was like a ticking bomb when I was just about to finish a massive selection and due to some faulty double click due to the computer hardware or a bug in Photoshop, it would just mess up regularly. So I forced myself to switch to the pen tool and it has been the most reliable when it comes to glitches or bugs. And one of the least mentioned plus points of the pen tool is that you can take a long break between complex selections. Basically, you don't have to worry about your selections getting messed up. And when you're done, you can create a path which can always be edited. Now for those who are starting out, the pen tool may look difficult to master. But once you really get the hang of it, you can make crisp selections with sharp edges and smooth curves. And it will prove to be a superior skill to have not only in Photoshop, but even in popular video or illustration apps that use a similar pen tool to create masks or design. So in Photoshop, there are three types of pen tool. The first one is the regular pen tool, which is completely manual. Then we have a freeform pen tool, which creates a freehand drawing of a path. And then we have the newly introduced curvature pen tool, which is easier to begin with, but has limited controls. And I'll show you how to use this in the end. And here on the panel, I have the same regular pen tool. So I'll select the pen tool. And first of all, I'll make sure that the path option is selected. The shape option is to make vector shape for designing purposes. What we want to do is create a path to isolate the subject or a certain area in the image. And the way to use this is simply to connect points to create a path. And there are two main modes in which you can use this pen tool. One is the standard way where the lines are created after you create the points. And the other mode which you can enable from this settings icon is the rubber band mode in the path options. Here you can also change the color and thickness of the path that the pen tool makes. Now take a look at what the rubber band effect does. It gives a preview of the line that you're going to make as soon as you move the pen tool cursor between clicks. Just like the polygon lasso tool. So this is exactly the same pen tool and you can think of it as a preview mode as it helps you visualize what you're doing. I usually prefer it off but you can keep it on if you like. And you can delete paths just by hitting the delete button until they're all gone. Now as soon as I start using the pen tool, you need to pay extra attention to the shortcut keys because you will need them repeatedly. Also pay attention to the changes in the pen cursor icon because they are going to tell you what is about to happen. And to begin with, you will see this asterisk next to the pen cursor. This means you are about to make a new path. And when you click, you will create a square point which is called an anchor point. Let me make a quick rectangular shape by clicking to create anchor points for the four corners. And as soon as I reach back to the first anchor point, you will notice a circle next to the pen tool cursor, which means you've come a full circle and you're about to close the path. 
And here on the top with this auto add delete icon checked on, if you want to add an anchor point, you simply hover over the path and the cursor gets a plus sign. And you can click to create an anchor point anywhere on the path. And to remove these anchor points, simply hover over it until you see the minus next to the pen cursor. And then just click to delete it. So that was easy. Now to select and move path around, we have these two white and black arrow tools. The time efficient way is to use a shortcut, especially for the white arrow tool, which is called the direct selection tool. And to activate it temporarily while using the pen tool, you have to press and hold the control or command key and you will see the cursor change. And what this white arrow or the direct selection tool does is that it can select and move each anchor point on the path. And if you hold shift and select anchor points, you can move them together. You can also move the side of the path or the path segment between these two anchor points. And finally, if you click and drag to select all the anchor points, you can move the entire path. And using it like this is what the black arrow or the path selection tool does. So the path selection tool selects the entire path but without having to select all the individual anchor points. Now once you memorize these shortcuts and the cursor changes, you can move to the next section which includes creating and modifying curved shapes. So the main shortcut that you'll be using here is to press and hold the Alt or Option key. And you get this Convert Point tool which has this particular angle icon. And what it does is it converts the corner anchor point into a smooth curve by pulling and dragging out the direction handles of the anchor point. And still holding Alt or Option with the Convert Point tool, if I click on the smooth curve anchor point, it resets it back to a sharp corner anchor point. So. Control or command shortcut is to select and move these anchor points around and alt or option is to convert these anchor points to a curve or reset it back. And you cannot press alt or option and just click on a corner point to make it a curve. You will have to drag out the direction handles from the anchor point. The direction handles start off being symmetrical on both sides. The reason they are known as a direction handle or a direction line is because they determine the direction of the curve we are creating and this rounded point at the end of each direction handle is called a direction point or a control point. And what this does is it controls the movement of that direction handle. Now here is the tricky part. To change the length or angle of the direction handles, we will have the same alter option and control and command shortcuts again for them. So pressing Ctrl or Command on a control point of a direction handle gives us the same direct selection tool or the white arrow tool. And what this does is it breaks the symmetry of the length of the direction handle and you can change them individually. And this is very useful if you want to go too far on one side to make a long curve. And pressing Alt or Option temporarily on a control point, you get the same convert point tool. And what this does is it breaks the symmetry of both the length and the angle of the direction handles. So you can move these individual handles separately in completely different directions. And this is used for changing the direction of the path without affecting the length or the angle of the opposite handle. And once you break apart the angle with the Alt or Option key, using the Control Command shortcut later will not be able to reset it back. And from here on they will work exactly the same way. The only way to completely reset the anchor point again is by pressing Alt and clicking on it and then you'll need to start over again. Now nobody learned all these shortcuts in one day and the only way to remember it is by practice. And it gets easier because these shortcuts are mainly used for fixing paths. But when you make yours manually, you'll try to get it right in the first place. So let me show you this process with a few tips along the way. And it doesn't have to be anything complicated. Even making a path around the lips of this lady will put in use everything that we learned. So let's do that. So I start by creating the first anchor point usually in some corner. And once I let go of the click, I'm ready to lay down my next anchor point. So here's the first tip. For slight bumps or subtle curves like this, click to create the anchor point and still holding the click, drag out the direction handle until you get that curve just about right. And still holding that click down, if you want to slightly move the anchor point, press spacebar and you'll be able to reposition the anchor point to anywhere you want. And then let go of the spacebar and release the pen or the mouse click. Now simply create the anchor points following the contour of the lips. And always make sure that you're inside of the edge that you're selecting. Otherwise you might get color fringe later. And when you reach a cusp, which is this sharp corner joined by two curved segments together, then what you need to do is drag out the direction handle and try and get one side correct first. 
and then hold Alt or Option key to break apart the link of the handles and swivel the angle of the other individual handle towards the new direction we're about to go. Again, click and drag the control point at the end of the direction handle to shape the curve. And still holding the click, press spacebar to reposition the anchor point if required. In the end, join the corners of the path by clicking on the starting anchor point to close it. And by the way, remember these important navigation shortcuts. To zoom in or out quickly, use the control or command and space bar and drag left or right to zoom. And to reposition the image around, just press the space bar to temporarily activate the hand tool and then drag around. These shortcuts come in very handy especially if you're making a large selection or a path. Now I'm going to do the same for the inner outline of the lips. The path tab stores the pen on a default work path layer. Now if you want to save this path, you have to rename it. So let's call it lips. And this is important because if you make some other path later, this work path will be replaced. For example, let me unselect this layer and show you one of these other pen tools. So this freeform pen tool is like a lasso tool for the paths and it lets you create a freehand path. While this could come in handy for illustrations, for photo retouching, I don't see much of a use in it. Anyway, look at the path tab now. It has created another default work path for it. So if I choose the new curvature pen tool now and try to make a square, it will become a circle because this tool turns every corner point into a smooth curve. And there are no direction handles for this tool to offer any control. The only way to control this path is by hovering your mouse over the anchor point or the path segment and then repositioning it. So it's very easy but limited. Anyway, look at our path tab now. Because we created our lips path, we can easily identify it on a separate layer. And this will help you to be more organized. Otherwise, Photoshop cramps all the path on the same work path layer. So for now, let's delete this work path layer. Okay, so now that you have a path, what can you do with it? The answer is right in front of you. Take a look at the top. You have the option to convert the path to a selection, create a vector mask or a shape. Keep in mind that this is not a regular mask. It is a vector mask. A path cannot be directly converted to a layer mask. It has to be converted to a selection first and then to a layer mask. And you can also reverse the process and convert a mask to a selection and then a path. But I'll get into that in a bit. First, let's start with selections. When your path is done, the fastest way to convert it to a selection is by using the shortcut Ctrl or Command and hit Enter. Or you can Ctrl or Command click on the path layer thumbnail under the path tab and make a selection out of it. Another way is to right click from within the path and click on make selection. And finally on the top, you can also choose to make selection. In these last two methods where you see three dots next to the make selection, you get an option to set the feather of the selection. So the feather radius simply blurs the edges. I always keep it at zero because we can control it later when we convert the selection into a mask. And that's why I prefer the control or command plus enter shortcut for this. Now before converting our selection to a mask, I want to tell you about how to modify and refine selections. So the basic ones are accessible through the Select Modify submenu. And they do exactly what their name suggests. And you will find the Expand and the Contract selections will be the most useful options here. And this Grow and Similar options mainly work if your selections are made based on the color and tone. For example, if you make a selection using the Magic Wand tool, these options might work for you. But with manual selections, they do a little bit of weird things. Anyway, in the last video, we saw how to use the new Select and Mask interface to refine our hair selection. But before that existed, the pros relied on something called the Quick Mask mode to refine selections. And many of them still use that. This icon here under the Tools tab enables the Quick Mask mode. Or you can use the shortcut Q to enable or disable the Quick Mask mode. When the quick mask mode is enabled and you have an active selection, a red overlay appears on the masking area and outside the selection. And this imitates the way a red acetate film was used to mask printed images traditionally. But here you can double click on the quick mask icon and you can change what the color indicates, masked or selected areas. And you can also change the color and the opacity of the mask. I usually set it to 50%. And also you will notice that the layer color changes. In my case from blue, it becomes red when I'm in the quick mask mode. And if I press Q to disable it, it gets back to the default blue color. So the point of the quick mask mode feature is to enable you not only to refine, but create entire selections by painting them in. 
For example, you could use the lasso tool to trace out the edge of that selection and then hit Q to get in quick mask mode and with a white brush, paint the area you want to select or refine an existing selection and with the black paint, you can erase areas you don't want to be selected. Once you're done, hit Q and bam, you have your new selection. So for some quick fix here and there, where you don't want to be bothered with creating a layer mask, you'll have this quick mask mode option. Anyway, now that we have our refined selection, we can convert it to a layer mask simply by clicking on this layer mask icon. And this will create a mask on the selected layer. I'm going to undo this because I want to show you another thing. So with your selection active, if you create any adjustment layer, for example curves, the selection will be automatically applied as a mask to that adjustment layer. And whatever adjustments we do with the curve will be targeted only to our selected area. So layer masks are not only for creating cutouts, they can isolate areas for targeted adjustments. But before we deep dive into layer mask, it is very important for you to understand that there are two types of masks in Photoshop. One is the pixel based layer mask which is more common and the other is the vector mask. If you've ever had any graphic design done, you've probably been exposed to the term vector graphic. And if I zoomed in very close to this image, you will notice it becomes blurry and the colors turn into little squares called pixels. Every photographic image that comes out of a camera is a pixel based image and is called a raster graphic. And anything we do with a pen tool is a vector graphic. A vector graphic is made up of points, lines and curves that are based on some mathematical equations and they're not colored square pixel based raster images produced by digital cameras. This means that no matter how close you zoom in on the image, the lines, curves or points created by vector graphics remain crisp and smooth. It can be stretched or made very small without any loss of quality. So paths are based on this vector graphic and that's why our lip path doesn't pixelate. Now, a vector mask is nothing but a resolution independent path that clips out the contents of that layer. So think of our vector mask as a modern clipping path for that particular layer it is applied on. For those who don't know, clipping paths were used back in the day because it could be exported to other print applications like Adobe PageMaker or CorelDRAW to clip and wrap text around the image. But now, almost every modern design application either has that capability or it is compatible with the Photoshop document. So this export as clipping path option is not used that much anymore. Now the way to create a vector mask from a path is with your path and pen tool selected, you can directly click on the vector mask option from the top. Or you can also right click and then create a vector mask. And from the menu, you can go to the layer, vector mask and choose the current path to create the mask of the selected path in the paths tab. And as soon as you create it, you will notice a gray mask on the layer just like you can in the paths tab. In fact, notice the vector mask has its own separate layer in the paths tab. So what does this tell us? This tells us that the vector mask is nothing but the same path layer but applied to the image layer in order to clip or mask out its contents. And you can also refine the vector mask further using the pen tool. And whatever modifications you do to the path on the vector mask won't affect the original path of the lip. And just like the layer mask, you can reduce the density of the vector mask to reduce the opacity in the properties. And you can also feather the edges of the mask. And you also have this option to rasterize it, which means it can be converted to a regular layer mask. Because if you remember, the regular layer mask is a raster graphic which is based on pixels, just like our image. That means that we can paint on it with all our regular brushes, like the clone stamp tool, dodge, burn and the smear tool. And regardless if you have an active selection or not, you can create a raster mask by clicking on the mask icon in the layers tab. And this will create a raster mask on the selected layer. Now the logic of a raster mask is that you can paint it with black to hide areas on the layer and white to reveal. So think of the mask being used as a stencil for the image on that layer. You can also paint shades of grey on the layer mask to make its content partially visible or invisible. Just remember black conceals and white reveals. And by default when you create a mask it is in the reveal all mode. That is, it's all white and we can see all the contents of the layer. But if you want to create a mask in the conceal all mode, that is a black mask that hides the content of that layer, all you have to do is hold alt or option and then click on the mask icon. And you can also go to the layer, layer mask and create a reveal all or hide all mask. And you can use this layer mask to isolate subjects rather than cutting them out and pasting them on new layers. Masking them out is a non-destructive method as you can fine tune them anytime by painting on the mask. 
And like I showed you before, mask on adjustment layers can also be used to apply targeted adjustments on that layer. Now here are some shortcuts for raster or layer mask that will come in very handy. To view the mask in your image window, press Alt or Option and then click on the layer mask thumbnail. And if you want to use the mask in a ruby lit or a red overlay like in the quick mask mode, then select the layer mask thumbnail and press the backslash key on your keyboard. You can also edit your mask with the brushes in this mode. And when you're done, hit the backslash key again to get out of the overlay preview. Now to hide a mask, hold shift and then click on the layer mask thumbnail and this will disable the mask and you should see a red cross on the layer mask thumbnail. And to delete it, you have to right click on the layer mask thumbnail and then click on delete mask. Now to cut and paste the mask from one layer to another, hold the control or command key on your keyboard and make sure to drag the thumbnail of the layer mask to another layer and the mask will disappear from the layer it was on and move to the new layer. And if you hold the shift key along with the control or command key and then drag the mask thumbnail to a new layer, your mask will cut, paste and also inward in the same move. Again, let me undo this. Now to duplicate or to copy and paste the mask from one layer to another, hold the alt or option key on your keyboard and then drag the thumbnail of the mask to the new layer you want to copy it on. And again, if you press the shift key along with the alt or option and then drag the thumbnail of the layer mask, your mask will duplicate and also invert at the same time. Now Photoshop allows you to have both a raster mask and a vector mask on the same layer. But this workflow could get complicated and a bit unnecessary. But it's nice to know that you have that option if you ever need it. Now to convert a mask back to a selection, you can right click on the mask and choose add mask to selection. Or the faster way is to use the shortcut control or command and then click on the layer mask thumbnail. And once you have your selection, there are quite a few ways to convert it to a path. So if you have any selection tools active, you can right click anywhere and choose make work path. Or if you have any other tool active, go to the path tab options and choose make work path from there. Or you can also click on the make work path icon below the paths tab. Now if you choose to click on the icon to create the path, it won't give you the tolerance option. But if you create work path from options or by right clicking any selection tool, you will see these three dots next to the make work path, which means it's going to give you an option dialog box. And here we can set the tolerance from 1 to 10 pixels. And tolerance determines how many anchor points you want in your path. If you set it to 1 pixel, you will have the most anchor points possible for that path. And if you set it at 10, you will have the least amount of anchor points for that path. And this number really depends upon the shape of your selection. So you have to punch in a couple of numbers to see what gives you the best path for your selection. Now you can edit this path using the pen tool with all the shortcuts we saw earlier. Or even the curvature pen tool does a decent job for this particular task of fine tuning an existing path. So we started this massive tutorial from paths and we are back to square one of the tutorial. And I believe this is because paths, selections, layer and vector masks are all different anchor points in Photoshop. You cannot know one without the other. And every selection tool has its use. You will have to choose the best tool for the job. And you know what? I'll show you some of my go-to tools in action. Let's start with the square marquee tool which is one of the most used selection tool and I use it for basic tasks such as extending the background or selecting a large part of the image. The lasso tool comes in very handy to roughly select a small part of the image and I use it a lot to target an area for liquefying or for using the warp transform tool to shape that area. Next is the quick selection tool which is a workhorse. You can make quick selections based on color and texture similarity and all you need to do is click and drag the area you want to select. And this tool will automatically and intuitively create a border for you. Even the newly introduced object selection tool works very similar to the quick selection tool. Instead of clicking and dragging, you have to define the selection area with a rectangle or the lasso mode. Once you draw a rectangular region or a lasso around an object you want to select, it does an impressive job of determining what you're trying to select inside the defined region. And this auto enhance option adds a slight amount of smoothing to the edges of your selection. But the difference is quite minimal so it's usually fine to leave it off. And by the way pressing shift adds to a selection while holding alt or option subtracts. Remember these two selection shortcuts because they work absolutely the same across all the selection tools. Now I mainly use these smart selection tools for creating masks for targeted adjustments like color correction or color grading where the edge smoothness doesn't need to be precise. 
Just don't fall into the trap of using these simply because they're the easiest. Anytime you need a slightly complex selection, it's best to use other methods. For example, this background. It might look an easy task for the quick selection tool, but the hair and transparency is where quick selection and object selection fails. As we saw in the last video, the new select subject does a great job with hair. But in this case, if I want to select and darken the yellow side of the backdrop, I'll first click on select subject, then refine the edge where there is hair, and choose the output as a selection. Then, as soon as I click on a curve, the selection will be applied as a mask. Now, if you hold option and click on the mask thumbnail, you can see the mask in the image, which is selecting only the subject. Because remember, white reveals and black conceals. But if I want the background to be selected, so I can target the adjustment on the background, that means I want the background in white and the subject in black, which is exactly opposite of this. So I can click on invert over here, or you can also use the shortcut Control or Command I for invert in Photoshop. So now that we have the background selected, I just want the effect to the yellow areas of the background. That means the green side of the background should also be black or concealed from the adjustment. So using the polygon lasso tool, make a selection around the green side of the background. Now all I need to do is fill black in this selection to hide the green areas. So now only the white areas of the adjustment layer will be targeted, which is the yellow areas in the background. So now I can just use the curve to bring down the brightness of just the yellow in the background. Now this was a longer way to do it, because as I told you, every selection tool or technique has to be chosen based on what you're trying to select in the image. So if I have to select the green side of the background, I know that I can use a color to create the isolation. And I have shown this technique in the luminosity masking video and even the previous select subject video. So for this task, I'll use the color range to pinpoint this particular green color and hold shift to sample all the shades so it becomes white in the preview. Next, I'll click on OK and refine the temporary mask. Again, for those who don't use the panel, this full technique is explained in the luminosity masking video step by step. The panel simply speeds up the process. And now I can output this mask as a selection but I know anyway I'm going to convert the selection to a mask for a curve adjustment layer and I can do that directly through the panel by loading this temporary mask as a curve. And now with the help of the curve which is targeting only the green areas of the background, I can create harmony that matches the existing color palette. You might have noticed that I use the curves adjustment a lot and this is because you can make almost every adjustment using the curves. Take a look at this video to see why curves is one of the best adjustment layers and how to use it. And if you want to learn about color harmony, take a look at this color theory video. Now if I want to select the brighter highlights of her face, there is no selection tool for that. This is where you need to use the luminosity masking techniques. And I've explained and compared them all in this luminosity masking video. For example, here I'll use the panel to quickly target the highlight that I want, load it as a curve, and pull the brightness down. And you could never do this with a path tool, right? So the point of this is that every selection or technique has its place. And the strength of the pen tool lies in creating smooth curves with full manual control. Now finally, let me quickly show you some of the lesser known secrets you can do with a pen tool and a path segment. So let me create a new path segment and a new layer. Now there are quite a few things I can do with this single path. I can create a smooth brush stroke over this path by right clicking with my pen tool and click on stroke path. So if I want to create highlights on the glass over the path, I could either use the dodge tool or the brush tool to add the highlight. I prefer the brush tool. Now whatever your brush size, flow or color setting was when you last used your brush tool, the stroke will be applied with that. So it's a good idea to set the brush tool to the stroke you want it to create before you right click with the pen tool to open the stroke part dialog box. And if I choose the simulate pen pressure option, it will gradually fade the stroke at both the ends. Take a look. There. Now I can change the layer opacity or blend mode to fine tune. And you can also transform it or mask areas from the highlight with your brush. Now the next thing is text on path. So you can create your own curvy path to write on or you can use one of these vector shapes, mainly the ellipse tool with which you can type in a circle. By default, this will create a shape and fill it with a selected color. But what we want is a path. So I'll change the default tool mode option from shape to path and create a circular path and if you hold shift, you can get a perfectly round circle. Now with a path drawn, we are ready to add our text. So select the type tool from the tools panel and make sure to have the text alignment option set to left. Now as soon as we move the type tool directly over the path, 
the text cursor will have a dotted wavy line. And this tells us that we are about to add text directly to the path. And to reposition this text along the path, you can choose the path selection tool which is the black arrow tool or with your pen tool active, you can temporarily hold control or command key to activate it. Now with the path selection tool, you can simply click on the text and drag it back and forth along the path. And if I drag my text too far, some of it gets cut off at the end. And to fix this problem, look for a small circle somewhere on the path, mainly where the text is being cut off. The circle marks the end of the visible area. Now you can simply click on the circle with the path selection tool or the control command key with the pen tool and drag it further down the path until the rest of your text reappears. As you're dragging your text along the path, be careful not to accidentally drag it across the path. If you do, the text will flip on the other side and may have a reverse direction. Once you're done, to hide the path, simply go to the paths tab and click somewhere to make the path layer inactive. And make sure to choose some other tool because the pen tool might activate the path again. Now let's move on to the coolest trick with paths that very few people know about. And that is creating fire along a path. And it is so simple to do in Photoshop because all you need to do is create a path and then go to filter, render and then flame. And Photoshop will do the rest. You can start with one flame along the path or choose any of these different options. Now you'll have to play around with the settings a bit to see what they do. And there are even more settings in the advanced tab like flame style and flame shape. Let's try one of this. And once you click OK, you will have your flame on the path. And this is just one example. You can create a lot more styles with other settings. So in this image, if I make a swirly path around the model, and create a new layer for the flame and then go to render and flame. And this time I'll use the second option which is multiple flames along the path. And it gives a ring of fire like effect. Now the preview cannot show the entire path but once you click OK the flame will be across the entire path. And I can also choose a custom color from here. For example, let's choose a blue color to create a magical blue flame. Now I'll set the quality to high and what you'll see is a very realistic render of the flame. Now I can use select subject and easily mask out the flame so it looks as if it's wrapping her around and it was so easy to create and if you spend the time to add light glows around her skin and her clothes this effect will look believable. But I'll leave that for some other tutorial. Right now let's move on to the final thing that we can do with the parts. So also residing within the filter and render menu is the ability to create trees. And while you can do this without the path, if you have created a path, you can make the tree follow the path you have created. And Photoshop gives you so many cool tree options to choose from. You can change the direction of the lighting or the amount of leaves and the thickness of the branch. You can also customize the color of the leaves and the tilt angle. And when you click OK, the tree will be created based on the path. Now, I wouldn't use this for photo retouching or even for photo composites because this effect looks like an illustration. But this is something you can use the path for if you ever needed an illustrated tree. Anyway, that ends this massive crash course to use the selection, pen tool and masking in Photoshop. And if you're new to Photoshop, this will be a lot of information to swallow in one video. So make sure to save it for later. Give it a thumbs up and share if you liked it. And remember to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified for upcoming videos. As always, thank you for watching. I'll see you in the next one.